CD Projekt Red preemptively have spoken out about crunch. Riot Games are standing their ground on their current arbitration cases. Capcom seem to be showing EA how engine development is done and far more in today's roundup. Hey everyone and welcome back to the first of this week's roundups, the show where we collect all of the important gaming news and bring it to you. And this week it's a pretty varied one with both experiments and successes being on display. Before we get into those though, it's time to talk about some more industry shenanigans and we'll kick it off with fan favorite CD Projekt Red. So according to Jason Schreier, a CD Projekt Red representative brought up the topic of working conditions to him as he was booking an E3 appointment. They then asked him if he would like to speak to Adam Badowski and uh, Marcin Iwinski, who are the studio heads um, of the studio on the subject. Now, when it comes to controversies, taking the initiative is pretty much the standard good approach. CD Projekt Red would like to state their official stance on crunch. They would like to explain their approach, and importantly, they want to get in there quick and control the narrative. They say they've been following the discussions in the industry recently, and that they wish to basically reaffirm that they are listening, learning, and working to improve. And if you're wondering why they're going on the offensive here, why they feel like they need to do that, CDPR have been in the headlines quite a lot before about having pretty bad working conditions on The Witcher 3, with allegations that really do seem similar to those um, laid at other AAA studios. Employees who are constantly overworked and underpaid, uh, no real choice if they want to keep their job, they just kind of feel like they have to crunch. It's an age-old tale, apparently exploiting the passion of those people in the games industry with basically year-long crunch. With Cyberpunk 2077 having as much ambition as The Witcher 3, if not more, the same concerns are sure to arise, and according to Jason, they have already begun. Here's one quote from Jason's article that he attributes to an unnamed CD Projekt Red developer. At times, I felt like I could just replace the studio name and the game title, and it would all look so similar, almost identical. And that was the employee referring to Jason's prior reports. Uh, you know, the stuff like, say, the Bioware uh, situation. Whether, of course, he meant Anthem and Bioware or something else, that's another story, but uh, it sure is a lot to say in just a small number of words from that guy. Jason then said that he's been contacted at various times by CD Projekt Red employees after breaking reports on crunch elsewhere in the industry, and that those employees have shared with him pretty different stories. Some employees feel like they're having the time of their lives, while other employees are feeling the exact opposite, with the crunch um, leading up to demos like E3 being the most egregious of all. Now, it seems like there's really nothing new here. It's just management defending their practices preemptively instead of having to, say, respond, you know, quickly to a scathing Kotaku article that's trying to expose them. However, well, CD Projekt Red are just, they're just not another AAA studio, right? Uh, they could in some ways get away with murder because of how they're looked up to as an exception in AAA, um, especially because they're Eastern European, they're kind of outside of the big American system and, you know, the American-Canadian system, uh, beating American corporations at their own game. You know, that's the kind of thing that a lot of the world can get behind. They are well-loved by gamers because of the outstanding quality of The Witcher 3 and how they engage in everyone's favorite business model. You know, just to produce a high-quality game and have customers buy it and not do too many any, you know, bad shenanigans. Uh, they're fully aware of this as well, with one of the opening lines in Jason's article being pretty interesting. And um, Iwinski said, we're known, let me be humble for a moment here, that we are known for treating gamers with respect, saying that they also want to be known for treating developers with respect as well. Now, they are big words, and much like other studios, they seemingly have yet to meet those words with any significant action. Now, they have defended their approach before, with Iwinski saying back in uh, 2017, this approach to making games is not for everyone. Now, for further context, this was in response to accusations of mismanagement on The Witcher 3 and to player concerns surrounding Cyberpunk 2077's radio silence at the time. Iwinski said, that basically they're trying to invent the wheel and that they want to make quality games, so they have to, uh, you know, give it their all as a studio. It feels like there's a sort of a push and pull here. The developers must suffer for the sake of the gamers or vice versa, and uh, I think that's a little bit of an unfair way for CDPR to frame it, being frank. It's a little worrying for employees who would, you know, just rather work reasonable hours and do good work, and then to be honest, while crunch sometimes might be a little bit necessary, employees who aren't worked to the bone 
well, they actually do tend to do a better job that's a lot more cost efficient. Now, in CD Project Red's defense for a moment here, though, they do at least pay their employees fairly generous over time, I believe. So there is at least some benefit uh, to people who are working in that environment, even if it is in Polish wages, which is quite a bit less than US wages. All of that said, there is something unique about Wadowinski and Badowski said to Jason. Now, while other companies have tended to make promises internally and rather quietly, or have just made cookie cutter public statements, CD Projekt Red's leads, like say they spoke to Jason, to Kotaku, so their employees would see that as a public pledge that they could fall back on. I mean, as Jason writes in his article, if a developer wants to opt out of crunch or take time off and their manager is resistant, perhaps they can say that they read on Kotaku that it was okay. We all have our doubts on whether that will work, but making a public affirmation that they run a non-obligatory crunch policy, knowing full well that Kotaku will hear about any, like, you know, about the outcome of that one way or another, it does at least show that they're somewhat confident in what they're saying here. At any rate, only time will tell. There's no doubt that Jason will have an article for us closer to Cyberpunk's uh, release that'll pretty much bear all. Like everyone else, CD Projekt Red are making promises, but this time they seem to be a little bit more realistic. There still will be crunch until the game is as good as it can be, but they'll try to be, in their own words, quote, more humane. So we'll just have to see how that one develops. Now, still on the topic of working conditions in the video games industry and uh, nice sounding promises, we have an update on the Riot Games employee walkout and what they're doing. So they're establishing a diversity and inclusion rioters council led by their chief diversity officer to um, take part in formal discussions on the cultural issues that the company reportedly faces. They've also invited a diverse group of staff to uh, revise their internal code of conduct. However, though, on the key issue that actually prompted the walkout, the forced arbitration for employees who make claims of sexual harassment, well, they're refusing to really move any further. What does that mean? Well, they're not dropping arbitration for any of the um, current active litigation, and they have reaffirmed their commitment to having an opt-out policy for the arbitration clause for all employees uh, at the minimum regarding the sexual harassment claims but the current ongoing things, they're not dropping those. So this seems to be another case of a company giving lip service to a display of dissatisfaction, promising to improve and offering ways that that can happen, but not taking action where they can immediately, even if they, you know, in their hearts actually do want to improve. Uh, it just means very little right now. I think the major issue though, is the change cannot happen overnight and things like this. Um, and it's hard to argue with what they've conceded here. They're in talks with staff to improve and they are setting up a Council to speed up that process, but it's just that. It's a process. And I think a part of this is exacerbated by the speed of today's news cycle. As far as the public eye goes, this probably marks the end of the saga, and we won't know if any actual change goes through or not for quite a long time indeed. You know, next week we'll have something else claiming the headlines. After all, incremental change doesn't really make for a clickable story. Riot Games are likely aware of this, being no strangers to controversy, uh, which kind of makes their claims even harder to believe. It must be frustrating for all parties, though, to be to be certain. And uh, as I've said before, I can only hope that the employee walkout here shows employees of other game studios around the world that they do actually have some sway, and that if they want to improve their situation, at least doing a walkout or something like that, it's it's a first step that they can take. Okay, next, let's move on to some more closely game-related news. So first, we've got some interesting experimentation from Valve. Valve have added a new experimental feature to Dota 2, which is the Avoid Player button. However, it's an experiment, and that means that it is actually locked behind the $10 battle pass. Now, many places have reported this as basically just being putting anti-abuse measures behind a paywall, which, I mean, there is a grain of truth to that, absolutely. It's not exactly true, though, or at least the context is very important. So, first of all, Dota 2 does have enemy chat mute, individual ally mute buttons. It even has an option in the menu to automatically mute all incoming text. That um, doesn't remove people from your game, but uh, neither does the avoid player feature. The avoid player feature, although currently not working very well, is simply letting the matchmaking system know that you'd rather not have someone on your team um, or in your game, something kind of like what Overwatch has had since launch, but ended up, I believe, quickly removing due to abuse. Now, in addition to the mute feature, Dota 2 also has a low priority queue. So if a player is basically reported and found to be misbehaving all the time, or if they're abandoning games or doing stuff like that, they do get dropped into a separate matchmaking category and uh, they'll stay there until they win a certain 
certain um, number of games while actually behaving decently. And then if they further act up in the low priority queue, they can actually get banned. Now, Dota 2 does have a notoriously vicious community, um, but that's not because Valve have figured out that paying to avoid toxic players is a good idea or anything like that. Valve are clearly trying their best within reason here, but it's a free-to-play game and there's just a sad reality there. If something's free-to-play, there'll be a lot of toxicity. In fact, they've encountered this very problem over in CSGO and they've performed a similar experiment over there. Prime status in CSGO used to be a lot more simple. A player who had a verified phone number on their account, well, they'd be put into prime matchmaking away from the unverified players. Now, given that you can't have the same phone number on multiple accounts, this went some way to isolate players who were using Smurf accounts to cheat and to hack. Now, this did change when the game went free to play back in December. So, after December, players who owned the game prior to it going free to play, they got prime, as do free players who play enough of the game to reach rank 21, which by most accounts does take a decent bit of gameplay. You can also buy it outright for $15, which basically is the price of the game. Uh, this is... I mean, it basically is a somewhat of a, of a class divide in the game, really, like we see with early access or expensive, uh, you know, special editions. Uh, free players, the ones who are more likely to break the rules because of their lessened investment, they're literally put in a separate queue to the paying people who have paid more and should be, I guess, guaranteed the better experience. I'm sure that's something I might cover, uh, you know, at, at length in a video someday because I find myself kind of fascinated by it. I absolutely am okay with, I guess, paying money to avoid unpleasant interactions in a free-to-play game if I've enjoyed the game, like getting premium status in a game if you buy a skin or something like that, and maybe that getting you a better queue. But the idea of expanding like this sort of class-based matchmaking queue, you know, if you're putting that on the likes of Anthem or The Division 2 or something like that, I mean it could get really bad. It could get really bad indeed. Like, if you end up being a super premium player, if you've spent over $150, uh, you know, on the store, and that gets you the most premium matchmaking queue, things like that could actually happen. And you know what? Uh, I would not like that at all. I think the reason why I'm somewhat okay with what they're doing with CSGO is basically just, it's I mean, it's kind of that free-to-play divide, right? It's kind of solving that. But anything further than that could really risk being a problem. As for what this is right now, well, I think it's mostly just Valve experimenting in their typically pretty libertarian way to um, systemically deal with players who lower the quality of the experience for others, but without overreaching and becoming authoritarian, like many uh, developers, such as, say, Blizzard, do when it comes to a lot of their anti-bad behavior measures. Okay, let's move on to a few more quick fire stories to wrap up today's show. We'll first elaborate on the successes of Capcom. In their financials that I covered in the last roundup, they mentioned something rather interesting. They said that their focus is on games that use their internally built RE engine, and they actually attribute that to a lot of uh, their success. Now, where have we heard that before? <laughs> so, unlike EA with Frostbite, Capcom seem to have actually built the RE engine with robustness and flexibility in mind, um, as they did with their previous engine, the MT framework. Now, the RE engine is currently seen in Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 2, uh, Devil May Cry 5 as well. It's also rumored, and this is uns um, unsubstantiated, but that it's rumored that it's going to be used for Mega Man X9, which is apparently going to be announced at E3. Now, robust engines with strong tools, they really can make a dev's life so much easier, and it looks like Capcom have somewhat nailed it with their RE engine so far, saying that it's one of their big strengths moving onwards into the next generation. So I hope that their success continues, because uh, for gamers, it's just resulting in us getting loads of great games, and I hope that others take no notice, because Capcom really are showing a lot of the world uh, really what a strong publisher can do, and they really have been on a roll recently. Now, to round it out, we've got something a little bit lighter and potentially kind of rude. Operation Dark Hours, the Division 2 raid, was successfully completed five hours after its launch on PC. However, on console, it took a whole three days. Now, a lot of people have offered up their opinions on this, blaming the 30 FPS limit on console, extra technical issues on console, and perhaps the lack of precision from using a controller versus using a mouse and keyboard. Uh, I'd say definitely that one. Uh, whatever the reason, though, I found the story to be kind of amusing because my first thought was pretty much as simple as this. You know, maybe the PC Master Race memes, uh, are, you know, have truth to them. In all honesty, though, I think that this somewhat reminds me of the World of Warcraft World First races, which 
to those of you who don't watch my other channel, uh, will be a bit of a new topic. Um, and because of that, I've just got to wonder if PvE games should maybe just generally have similar events, because it's it's kind of interesting, these, these races. For World of Warcraft, it actually drove a lot of Twitch viewership recently, and I'd kind of love to watch a quality production of The Division 2 or Destiny 2 endgame content being, you know, raced and hyped up. The console versus PC angle could be hyped up as well, you know, a three-way race between uh, the best teams in PS4, PC, and Xbox One. Sure, it would not be the most competitive thing of all time, but if it was handled similarly to how some of the World of Warcraft events have been done, it could be a pretty interesting watch, and importantly for the developer, a pretty pretty good advertisement for the game's high-end content. But yeah, there we go. As always, there's a lot more news in the gaming world, but I like to stick to the interesting pieces that I think and we'll all enjoy hearing about and might actually learn something from. So I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, video. I'd love to hear what you think about CD Projekt Red and what they're doing, what's up with Riot, and I think especially what your thoughts are on Valve's like anti-toxicity stuff and how it generally it seems to be very different to what a lot of other companies uh, do, because I found that to be a very interesting topic. So. Thank you very much for watching this video. Let me know what you think. And with that, I'll see you next time.